Oh, it's from. Testing, testing, testing. Testing, one, two, test. Greetings, thank you for coming tonight. Uh, my name's Ben Hickey, I'm the curator of exhibitions here at the Hilliard Art Museum. And I have the tremendous pleasure of both introducing and having worked with Kay Ito, who will be speaking this evening. Kay is a visual artist, primi uh, working primarily with cameraless photography and installation art. He's currently teaching at the International Center for Photography in New York City. He earned his BFA from the Rochester Institute of Technology, very close to my hometown, and his MFA from Maryland Institute College of Art. Um, some of Ito's most noteworthy accomplishments include residencies at the studio at Mass MoCA, the Dennis Roussel Fellowship at the Center for Fine Art Photography, the Center for Photography at Woodstock um, as well, and his bibliography includes reviews and articles published by the Washington Post, Hyperallergic, Art Maze Magazine, and others. Additionally, his work reside in the permanent collections of the Museum of Contemporary Photography, the Norton Museum of Art, uh, Chroma at the California Institute of Integral Studies, and the Eskenazi Museum of Art. So uh, with, with no further ado, I, well, actually, I lied. With one bit of ado, I apologize for the sun. Early in the season, it becomes a technical issue with cameras facing certain ways and other ways. But I think that perhaps we can all enjoy the irony of this for an exhibition called <laughs> Each Tolling Sun. So um, as, the, as, the, as the fall progresses, the sun will not be an issue as, as the tilt of the earth changes. So thank you for your patience and good humor. And now, with no further ado, Kay Ito. Thank you so much. And it's kind of, as Ben was saying, ironic that my works deal a lot with the sun. And the sun is the one that's kind of like 
bathing, everyone's bathing over the sun, so it's really funny. Um, so I'm really honored to be here. Uh, this is the first time being in Louisiana. Uh, well, not true, I've been to uh, New Orleans just one day, but besides that, actually, I had gumbo, I had catfish, it has been amazing. And thank you for the museum and the Ben, you know, long friend and amazing curator to make this talk and uh, exhibition possible. Um, <clears throat> So I'm a visual artist living and working in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, I'm currently teaching, as Ben was saying, I teach at ICP as a continuous education. So it's not really full faculty, but more or less than a glorified workshop. But I get to have their email, so it's really nice. <laughs> so many of my work explore the theme of intergenerational trauma rooted in the nuclear weapon. What it means, so it, it's, theme kind of continuously evolved into the what it means for me to be in the United States as an immigrant and a third generation Avon victims. Um, as Ben was saying, I mainly utilize a cameraless photography, it's, which is really means a photography that doesn't use camera to create artwork. So this practice came to me when I realized if a camera is a device that captures something that's in front of you, then how do I capture something that is invisible, such as radiation, trauma, memory, and a liminal space between life and death? My answer was to get rid of the camera and use the most basic and primitive aspect of photography, which was the light and shadow. I also combine my practice as an installation artist and a sculptor to create an immersive installation, art, installation artwork, which I call them a temporal memorials, that then become a platform for the audience to explore the social issues. They also st stand as a temporal monuments dedicated to the losses suffered from the consequence of those issues and how it affects us even today. So before I can get into the individual of the project, I must talk about the origin of my nuclear trauma, which is my grandfather seen here. So my grandfather Takeshi Ito was a high school student when the bomb in Hiroshima detonated. He survived the bombing, yet he lost most of his family member from radiation poisoning, and actually my, one of my great aunt actually lived uh, working at the ground zero, vaporized right away. From his experience, he became a profound anti-nuclear activist, fought against a nuclear weapon throughout his life, until he too passed away when, when I was nine years old from cancer. You would expect from, and this is baby Kato right there, um, as you would expect from nine years old kid, I don't remember too much about him besides him being the amazing grandfather. And certainly he didn't tell me much about his struggle and his experience of Hiroshima. But one thing, one thing I do remember him telling me was that day in Hiroshima was like a hundreds of sun lighting up the sky. And this statement of hundreds of sun stayed with me for entirely of my childhood in, even until today. So that statement kind of led to the creation of my first project I ever made regarding the nuclear weapon. So in order to express the connection between the sun and my family history regarding this idea of witnessing hundreds of suns, I started to create an annual edition of either sets of 108 prints or roughly 200 foot long scroll. Uh, these are made by exposing type C photographic paper, aka chromogenic photographic paper or regular color darkroom paper to sunlight timed by the duration of my breath. So each, each print's exposure is that's the exposure. So a lot of my work deconstruct the photography as a machine-based machine art into more organic and 
One, you may actually call it a ritualistic image making. <clears throat> and this project was kind of beginning of that journey, essentially. And you, you would, exp um, as I use the sunlight as the source of the light, every single print is unique depending on what day, what time, what year, uh, what day, of, uh, what part of the day, um, and it changes so much. So I'm getting rid of, rid of the control, just like many of these um, devastation, trauma, usually happens without any kind of control for the person who are victim. Like victims are people who received, but they don't really have any control over controlling this trauma. <clears throat> Um, so I use 108 as any, if any of you have been to the show, I made 108 prints. Here there's 108 prints here as well. Uh, I use 108 as a point of the number that I use from my childhood, which associated with the significance in Japanese Buddhism. <clears throat> so what happens is throughout New Year's Eve to New Year's Day in Japan, Every single Japanese temple, which is millions of them, strikes this human-sized bell 108 times. And by living in Japan, you cannot not hear the, the bell no matter where you are. And it's supposedly every single bell toll get rid of the, human, the evil passion and the desire you possessed. And by hearing 108 strike, you face the new year with a cleansed self. So I'm using this idea of the redemption inside of my artwork. Uh, also, if I don't choose a specific number, I will keep making and making and making and never stop. So 108 is a good number. So the number 108 became a motif in my art making along with the use of the sunlight. Uh, the whole process of creating these prints, as I say, became a ritualistic image making and this whole base of the making of my artwork was kind of formed with the sun gazing project. Uh, speaking of the ritualistic image making, uh, After Image Requiem is a great example of using not only my breath, but also my own body. So this is a very large scale visual and sound installation containing 108 human scale photograms and a four channel sound work made by my sound collaborator, Andrew Paul Kuiper. In 2017, I started to collaborate with my longtime friend and the sound artist, Andrew Paul Kuiper, which is resides there. Um, and the significance here is his grandfather was an engineer who participated in the Manhattan Project, meaning his grandfather contributed of developing of the bomb, and my grandfather was receiving end. But we are great friends. He was actually my best man for the wedding. <laughs> um, and we kind of overpassed that past trauma and collaborate together to create one single space that audience also can participate in. So this piece was debuted at the Baltimore War Memorial in 2018. And one of the main reason why I chose or we chose this building would be, I don't know if any of you know where the Baltimore is, but Baltimore is right next to DC. <laughs> um, and DC, about 45 minutes, an hour. So if the nuclear weapon strikes DC, Baltimore is most likely gonna be also a target. So this building would be the place that people will be, uh, the government would be setting up a triage, a makeshift hospital, so that everybody placed here is gonna be placed like what you see in the installation. <clears throat> so as I was saying earlier, these prints were exposed with my own body placed on top of the uh, photographic paper exposing to the sunlight. Um, and I was fully naked, by the way. <laughs> um, so, but this refers to this idea of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki shadow. The explosion was so, uh, ex <clears throat> sorry, the heat of the explosion was hotter than the core of the sun itself vaporizing people's body right away. 
So there's a lot of um, the, the shadow that imprinted on the ground that actually this section of the staircase can be seen at the Hiroshima Peace Memorial, uh, Hiroshima Peace Museum, if you ever visit uh, Japan and Hiroshima. So I was kind of using that notion and the trauma into my artwork, recreating and bringing them into the contemporary um, setup. Um, so where I was thinking the use of my own body was the radiation that was grandfather was exposed to pierced through his skin and inscripted itself to his gene and that I inherited when I was born. In a way, I'm using my own body as a piece of film or camera itself to create these artwork. So the space was actually lit by a single light placed on the front, meaning whenever audience go in front of the one of the print, actually their own shadow overlap with my irradiated shadow captured on the print. So by doing so, I'm hoping that people realize that this issue of the nuclear weapon is not the thing of the past, but this exhibition was trying to reach from the past, connecting to the present day, for not to repeat what has already happened in the future. Uh, this piece was exhibited in many different ways. Uh, this was at the Southeastern Center for Contemporary Art where I, we couldn't place every single print on the ground, so we ended up placing on the wall. Uh, now it kind of implied this idea of the cathedral in a way, um, and that was really interesting. And I like to change the installation depending on where it's shown, because I consider the space itself as a part of the collaborator. <clears throat> oh, sorry. The many of the project was in Many of my projects were inspired by stories of irradiated trauma, not only the suffering of my grandfather, but also many of the other people, including American downwinders. How many people know what is American downwinders here? Downwinders. So down, American downwinders are the people who are exposed to the radioactive uh, particle during the Cold War or even the during World War II, you'd be surprised that one of the first victim of the nuclear weapon were not Japanese or American. Uh, people who worked at the Los Alamos, if anyone have seen the Oppenheimer, the film, um, but there's a many, US government actually continued testing the nuclear weapon in Nevada, Utah, New Mexico throughout the Cold War uh, until 1992 and the people lived there, many of the people lived there without knowing the consequence of living in that area. And these people were known as a downwinders. And as you can see, all of the particle from the nuclear testing, <laughs> nuclear testing actually went spread so far that technically anyone who were living in that time are considered to be a downwinders. <clears throat> So Eiffel Witness is a collection of sea print uh, photographs that I usually make depicting 108 eyes. 54 eyes came from the American downwinders and 54 eyes came from the Japanese Hibakusha Avon victims. The original image of the eye were captured from books, video interviews, and image even I gathered from my own family album. Uh, this was originally made at the, my, uh, <clears throat> I was the residence, uh, I was the artist in resident at the University of Utah, which had the largest collection regarding downwinders in the United States. So I worked with them to create this artwork. <clears throat> the processed prints were later mixed up when I installed the piece, so it's impo well, not impossible, but it's really hard to tell which I belongs to Japanese and which I belong to American, indicating that <clears throat> the nuclear weapon affect everyone the same way, no matter their nationality. So I'm trying to create shared trauma hood in, on this <clears throat> uh, installation. 
So this project is an example of my utilization of the archive in a way that extends beyond myself and my story into a larger audience and context. Continuing from the same project, uh, in 2021, uh, I was uh, an artist in resident at Mass Mocha Studio Program, uh, where I created this ephemeral projection installation-based artwork using the same sets of 108 eyes. Both came from Japanese and American nuclear weapon victims. I used the modified slide projector to cast these imagely of the eyes on the building of the Masmoka. And there's a reason why I specifically chose Masmoka as the, to do this project. <clears throat> so many of the Masmoka's building were once occupied by an electronic company called Sprague Electronic during World War II where they manufactured a special capacitor used in the building of the atomic bomb dropped in Hiroshima. Meaning if this, like this is the part of the contribution to let who I am. So I'm kind of creating, I'm connecting these two dots to create this performance installation artwork. So again, I casted 108 of them <laughs> the museum only allowed me to do this from 9 to 2 a.m. So every night, and that was December, by the way, it was freezing up, up not upstate, but Massachusetts, cold. Like I was huddling with the jackets and such. But I think in the end, that was a really um, strong project, and it really made sense for me to do in this project over there. I don't know if we ever been to um, uh, Masmoka, but this is a Sol Luit permanent collection space over there. Um, and again, I created 108 of them. Um, what, hey Ben, uh, do I have like 10 more minutes maybe? Okay, uh, then let me talk about Burning Away, which is one of the newest projects I've been working on, um, and the, the, uh, the projection piece, and this piece is gonna be my upcoming project at the Georgia Museum of Art uh, happening next year. Uh, so I'm currently nonstop working on these projects. <laughs> um, sorry, the visual maybe trigger warning. Um, so one of the, the inspiration for making this artwork was many of the um, many of the victims of the nuclear weapon in Hiroshima and Nagasaki were exposed to the, such an extreme heat that they got um, terrible um, burned that they didn't have any medicine to treat. Uh, and that's one of the biggest issues that and tend to be, people tend to it, uh, scratch it because they get itch. Uh, so one of the peop one of the thing people did, and I read about, was applying some uh, oil, like a vegetable oil, olive oil, honey, mortar oil, whatever the kind of oil is. What it does is it seal from um, it seal from the air itself, so it doesn't get blistered. Uh, but I was fascinated by this desperate measure to trying to heal themselves. So what I was doing in this particular project was um, I exposed the photographic paper and I was start drawing on top of the uh, photographic paper with using the sun, uh, using the honey, olive oil, tang oil, um, any kind of oil I can get hands, get hands on and creating this figurative artwork. And what I do is I dip them into a developer and the fixer spontaneously, probably 50 times to 100 times, um, over and over and over and over. And by doing that, some of the oil, like some of the oil that doesn't stick on the paper washes off easily, and some of the harder consistency, which is like honey, stays on. So it creates this intricate pattern that inspired from this people trying to heal the, the charred trauma. And the funny thing about this project is, if you stay far away, 
it, it, it come across as a figurative, but when you get closer, people might actually see it as a topological map or even look like a microscopic view of the cancer cell. And that's something I was surprised by after making these things. And as you can see, most of my artwork, I, the chance is part of my artwork. I don't fully have a control over some of the aspect of the making of the artwork. The result of the imagery sometime is completely unexpected from uh, what I originally thought. But I embrace that. Um, and that's something that people can sometime you know, appreciate and not appreciate about, but that's just how I make artwork. <clears throat> um, and one thing I want to say about many of my projects is even though the inspiration is based on death and trauma, the project is usually actually more about healing and the use of the ritualistic art making as a mending tool. It focuses on the scar and suffering is only an indication of where we have been and not the dictation of where we go from here. But rather, it is about how we can come together, heal, and to break the cycle of the war and pain. So that's something I've been always trying to strive for. And that's something I try to achieve that within that installation we have in this museum as well. Um, so I recently had the show, and this is kind of like a fun, I didn't know if I have enough time, so if I had, I want to talk about it quickly. Um, I've been expanding my pr um, practice beyond f just a photography, and this is a great example of what I've been working on. So this is a painting painted straight on the wall. You may call it mural or whatsoever. Uh, and what it does, uh, what it's shaped of is I took the long side of the each way um, of the, the bomb that dropped in Hiroshima and create essentially a box perfectly fitted, custom made for uh, the bomb. And by doing so, I was essentially making a coffin for these weapons. <coughs> and the fascinating thing about this particular paint is this paint contains iron metal. So what it does is, this is day one of painting on the wall. As you can see, this was completely black as, as it begins. But as time goes by, the oxidation actually rust the paint itself. And throughout the exhibit, the, the forming of the rust can be seen. So like the day one of uh, exhibition opening looks completely different from the closing of the exhibitions. Uh, so this is kind of like, and I even consider this as a photography because it uses chemical reaction. I, I think photography is the most flexible way, and some photographer hate me that for. <laughs> um, but I just wanted to show this project uh, just quickly to just show you what I've been working on. And yeah, Ben, do you think this is a good time to move on to the, the Q&A or? Thank you. Uh, I think this is so close to it that you make in the sound. So the 
projector is not on. Oh, okay. Well, we'll talk about it. Yeah, well, oh, oh, absolutely. I just oh, no, no. But like, it's always good to have a fellow Baltimorean. I agree. I agree. Charm City. Yes, exactly. <laughs> So yeah, uh, we can talk about whatever if you have any question regarding this exhibit or the, the pieces I was showing in the presentation. Anyone? Any taker? That is a great question. Um, and should I repeat the question or? Okay. Oh, okay. Sure. So the so burning away was using the process called chemigram. Chemigram essentially it combines the painting and the photographic paper. Essentially, painting with oh, the how do I say it? The surface is photographic, but painting uh, method is painting. Um, so as you, were, as you saw in the presentation, I was placing the photograph paper on the ground, painting like a Jackson Pollock style. I, ha I ha hate to make that, <laughs> make that connection. But, um, but so you're right. The, so many of the, the object and the material I use is non-archival. And even though photographic paper itself is archival by placing these, and some of the stuff like a tongue oil, it soaks into the paper. So after I wash it so much, you can still smell the tongue oil. Um, so yes, archival part of it. I'm part of the school of the thought of photography, because many photographers are obsessed with the archivalness. Like, oh, like silver gelatin paper, this lasts for 500 years by placing this mat, that ultra archival, this frame, this glass. Like, we are, the, some of the photographers' work would last like thousands of years. But who, who is that piece is for? If not, wasn't for who would see it and apply to, you know, everyday life of today. So like what I, what I think, as you can see, my, many of my project doesn't even have a frame. It's straight on the wall. I place stuff on the ground and sometimes it's get damaged. I, I do embrace the idea of the ephemeral and essentially almost performative part of the phot photographic paper. Like I embrace the paperness of it. So yes, uh, some of the conservator hard to like hate to work with me because of the I use specific material, but I think I think that the materiality and the concept is so important for me that I, I kind of like uh, down with the uh, archival and trying to create something that makes sense for me at the moment. If that makes sense, that, that's a great question. Thank you. Any taker? Um, can you talk a little bit about what embodiment means for you in your work? Embodiment of, because that, that could go so many different ways. Oh. Yeah, I just want to hear you talk about that. So, I, well, first, I'm a Pisces. So, I, <laughs> my, uh, my explanation of the thing may not make sense to you right away, but trust me, it will get back to you at some point. <laughs> so, I consider every single artwork I create is a self portraiture. What I mean is not necessarily I literally place the camera and take a picture of myself, but Every single historic, historical narrative, even it's mine or not mine, I have to digest it within, well digest is the wrong word, but I need to filter it through me and trying to find my perspective of it and how do I connect. And by doing so, I make 
a contemporary connection to the historical issue. And I think that's the way I, I'm acting as a binding. I'm, I'm acting as a binder, and I call exhibition space as a platform for for the past and present and the future can get together in the same time. So embodiment, I always think that a lot because for self-portraiture, I need to make everything embodied within me first, then express it, not just take it place it there, I need to literally take it and be part of me to make artwork, if that makes sense. Yeah, so, see, it kind of came back to it. <laughs> Anyone else? Absolutely, um, uh, that's kind of interesting thing. So uh, in the presentation, I talked about the ritualistic image making. So so many of my artwork, I create them in the dark, photography doing in the dark, there's an ongoing joke about that. But so we, so almost every single ritual I do takes place in the dark, thus you can't really take a video or documentation of it. It's not like I can bring everyone into the dark room and me doing the performance. So like most of the time, people see the result of my performance, and people can get the idea of what I did, not necessarily what I was doing. Well, not what I'm doing. No, people don't see the performance at the, at the moment of making of the project, but I've been doing the pro uh, I've been doing the project that which I can co incorporate the aspect of the performance that done in the daylight or in the actual regular light, so I can actually take a video of it. And to me, like that's kind of getting more interesting as an artist that I was only showing the print-based um, result of my performance, but if the performance is the where the, all of the magic happens, then why don't I show that to the audience? Um, if anyone haven't like really read any of the statement, uh, there's a quick recap of what I did for this show was um, this metal disc used to be completely flat. Uh, so what I did was uh, I took the, uh, the sledgehammer that's on the wall right now and I struck it as hard as I can. And every single time I struck it, I made, I made a print with the, using the sunlight, exposing to the sunlight. So every single time I struck and I go off the, off the um, screen, was, I was making the print. And every single time I make the print, you can see the progression of the deterioration of the, the metal seen in these prints. And by striking 408 times, this was a result. And I'm, you know, my wimpy arm can only do that much. But <laughs> um, I was, I was hoping that would be completely crumpled. But um, Ben and I always talk about it looked like a fruit bowl, like from high end store, like from the anthropology <laughs> or something. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know if it's a good thing or not bad thing, but you know, it, but it's a result of what I did. <laughs> And the use of the metal or steel uh, specifically was, you know, this idea of the, the how humanity, especially, you know, post-World War I or even the medieval, like this metal has become the uh, representation of human progress, but also the warfare. And I'm using this as a metaphor. And also I have a complete, as you can see, the complicated relationship with the sun. I, I, always consider sun as a giver and a taker. Um, and as a Buddhist, I kind of like every single object and event has both good and bad. Sun is the same way. It, it provides us life and it takes away life. Most likely, if we don't die from COVID, disease, or whatsoever, humanity or earth going to be destroyed by consumed by the, the sun, sun eventually. 
and you know that's kind of really interesting to me. So I was using the metal representation of the sun, and I was smacking hell out of it. Um, and I think that's the most abstract performance I ever done uh, throughout what I have done in the performance. But I think that's really it. Really opened up my scope of what I can do next. And I really want to thank Ben for allowing me to do a lot of experimental stuff for this installation. After Image Requiem. Requiem, yep. <laughs> it's so funny about me and the collaboration between me and uh, Andrew. Uh, so we can never settle with the name. He always come up with a million different names. I always come up with a million different names. We never agreed on what we want to call it. So what happened is after, Im after image is my part of the name, Requiem is from his part of the name, and we just combine these two together. And like, we worked on like six different projects, and it's always the same way. Some ash like scan, silver plate, after image Requiem. Uh, it's just, uh, he, oh, sorry. he's a fantastic guy, but when it comes to naming, I think I can do it. <laughs> um, anything else? Yeah, I had a question about, so you talked about how uh, the mistake was the same as the Mm-hmm. Absolutely. It was a it was really a happenstance, as you, as you can see. The like you know originally that that my association with the sun was my grandfather's statement of witnessing hundreds of sun, but more and more I think about how we depended on the sun, and the sun always has been the inspiration of the religion religious act from the ancient time to today. That's the kind of the planet that always existed as far as a human existed. Exactly. And that's a real, and again, if you, if you want to dive into like this old Japanese imperialism and all that thing, like the sun always has both inspiration or both aspect of life and uh, taker, life and death. And it inevitably became the theme of my artwork by using these um, the sunlight, but I don't know. I still have a complicated relation with the sun. I still love it and I still hate it. <laughs> so that's kind of sh short and long of the my relationship with the sun. Thank you. Yes. Good question. Um, so I wanted to make a sculpture that actual like, so essentially I think that piece, specifically that installation was blueprint to make the, the coffin. But uh, I mentioned about the upcoming show in Georgia Museum of Art. I actually gonna be rusting the actual steel plate, uh, the size of the thing. So I actually can make a coffin um, to, so like I wanted to use a steel uh, or iron as the, you know, sorry, I think I wasn't answering your question. So the reason why I was, I was so drawn to the rust, not the iron, but rust, was I was thinking if I were to make a coffin for these weapons, what would be the best material to make that coffin if, what is a dead form of the weapon? And to me, that was rust. Like, and as the name is uh, R dash st in peace, so people can read it as rest in peace or rust in peace. I originally call it rust in peace, but people, well, the, my partner said that that's too corny. <laughs> uh, so like, oh, why don't you put the dash on the bottom so people can make up you know, either rest in peace or rust in peace. Um, so that's why I was so attracted to rust. And I actually do use rust a lot in my artwork as 
Not, uh, so that project I made about the coffin for the bomb, um, it's an ongoing project. I'm actually making one for the AK, AR, Glock. Uh, living in Baltimore, the gun violence is everyday life. And I want to put these all over the weapon, make a coffin, and never see it again. So that's kind of like, that's why I'm so attracted to Rust and trying to create this coffin. And hopefully, you get to see it the different version in the future. So thank you for the great question. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.